Hello and welcome to Behind the Byline. I'm Savani. And I am Sabine. And we are the co-founders of Hidden Compass. Today, we're introducing you to one of our remarkable storytellers, journalist Melissa Hart. Thank you so much for joining us, Melissa. Oh, thank you. It is my pleasure. I love what you're doing with Hidden Compass. Thank you. And we're so excited to talk to you about your story. For the audience, Melissa's feature, The Vaudevillian Ghosts of Liberty, takes front and center in our Chasing Demons department. And this story brings us on stage a century ago with performers whose existential barter shines a light, a spotlight on modern entertainment. So Melissa, you explore a lot of different themes and topics and questions in the story. And a fundamental question you explore here is how you should feel about your family connection to vaudeville. You talk about pride, you talk about shame. So without giving away where you came out on that question, can you tell us about those emotions and what it was like to explore them? Oh yeah, Whew. writing this essay was an emotional roller coaster for sure. So I grew up getting to know my great grandmother. She lived until she was 96 and we would go and visit her in Monterey several times a year. And while the adults sat around the table talking and laughing and telling jokes because she was forever telling jokes, I would get to slip away and go into her bedroom where she had two big dressers and a closet full of newspaper clippings and photos and costumes and other showbiz paraphernalia from her vaudeville days with my great grandfather. And I honestly grew up thinking that she was as famous as another vaudevillian, Judy Garland. In fact, I think I often had the two of them kind of confused in my mind. And so it really took a while um, to get over this sort of very simplistic pride at being part of this show business lineage. But as I got older and went to school at UC Santa Cruz, I started hanging out with my great grandma in Monterey a bit more and really listening deeply to her stories. And then I realized that she and my great grandfather we're just two in hundreds and hundreds of vaudeville performers in the 1910s, 20s, and 1930s. And they worked so hard. They worked at theaters throughout the U.S. and Europe and Japan. And, you know, they made some money, but they weren't that famous. So even though sometimes they got top billing, other times they didn't. And so... While I was still very proud of them, I no longer had her confused with Judy Garland. But then I started working a couple of years ago on a historical novel based on their vaudeville days. And I started uncovering some stories about vaudeville as an art form that broke my heart. And so I was really, really sad and angry to read about people like Burt Williams, who was the first Black performer to star in the Zigfield Follies and how theater managers forced him as a Black man to perform in Blackface. And he basically worked himself to death and died at a pretty early age. It broke my heart to read about how Duke Ellington, when he played with his orchestras, would rent a separate train car so that they would have some place to eat and sleep after their performances because the local hotels and restaurants wouldn't give them service. Um, it broke my heart to read about female impersonator J Julian Elting, who had to hide his sexuality um, because he feared homophobic repercussions. And so as I was reading about the how deeply racist vaudeville could be, how deeply homophobic, I got confused. I didn't understand whether my great-grandparents were complicit in this racism and hom homophobia. And then things got weird because I, I started to uncover, um, and it took me a long time. I wish I had seen this Saturday Night Live video with Nathan Lane about the history of vaudeville, which sort of encapsulates in five minutes what it took me six months to uncover. And that's that many of the performers traded on their own ethnic stereotypes to get a laugh and make a buck. And so 
I won't tell you how I reconciled all of these confusing um, these emotions. Uh, you'll have to read the the piece to to figure out how I came out on the other side. But it was a wild ride for sure. It sounds like it, and you know, your answer to this question sort of leads into what I want to ask about next, which is journalism isn't generally personal, but obviously this story is. And what is the the value of that? What's the value of sharing a personal story in a larger journalistic context? I feel like anytime we can help the reader make a personal connection to either the journalist or a, a featured source in a story, that builds empathy for, um, for the storyteller. And so I think think hopefully that personal connection I make with my family invites readers to come on this journey with me um, from a place of kind of simplistic pride to anger and hurt and confusion and then out the other side. It was so much fun to, to be able to share my grandmother, my great grandmother with readers. She was a remarkable woman up to the time she was 96 years old. And she had a strange and unusual life. And I loved being able to showcase it a bit in this story. I hope it helps readers, not just to understand what vaudeville is, but to understand one of the, one of the key players. Well, we're honored that you shared that story with us and with our readers. And speaking of personal connection, you know, at Hidden Compass, we really try and foster personal connection with our storytellers and our journalists. And for those who are not familiar with our patronage model, we run a patronage campaign with every story that we publish. So those proceeds are split 50-50 between us at Hidden Compass and the storyteller on top of their article pay. And it's a way for you as a reader who is moved by the story and wants to connect and directly support a storyteller to do so. So thank you to those who have already done that, those who haven't should definitely uh, consider contributing. And Melissa, I'd like to ask you what you would like to say to those who have already contributed to your campaign. I am so grateful. You know, I'm a freelance journalist and we don't make a lot of money. <laughs> I think some people have the misconception that we do. And it took me between 40 and 50 hours to research and write this piece. So I am just thrilled that people believe in this story enough and, and believe in the importance of the history of vaudeville and theaters and those performers to, to help make it a bit easier to tell more stories. As I said, I'm working on a historical novel as well. And so any of this funding directly goes to pay my you know utility bill as I delve into more research and more writing. I also feel just so gratified that people who are contributing care about the art form of vaudeville as much as I do. It really provides a basis for so much of the entertainment that we love now. I'm thinking America's Got Talent and The Voice and The Moth Storytelling Show. Any program on stage or on the screen that has short variety acts, SNL, the John Oliver show, uh, variety acts one after another owes a debt to vaudeville. And so how wonderful that we can keep it alive in this way. I, I also appreciate the contributions because I think probably the story about racism and homophobia in the um, in the early 1900s, 100 years ago, maybe resonates with some readers, um, particularly now. And um, I, I, I wanted to share how comedy addresses and even mitigates some of this prejudice in theaters and hopefully translating beyond the theater doors. Um, I'm gonna pause here. I don't know how much more you want me to say about this, but I wanted to say that it's interesting to note that my grandmother and my mother grew up in a big world, thanks to my great grandparents' uh, vaudeville uh, career, and and you know they they watched my great grandparents embrace all types of people, and though my mom uh, married a man, 
she eventually left her husband for a woman and and got married to her eventually. And uh, I would mine and a homophobic judge took me away from her and said I could no longer live with her and forced me to live with my father, who was abusive. And the reason I'm telling you this is that the homophobia and the racism that people experienced in the 20s and in the late 70s is a cautionary tale, especially in the face of contemporary book bans and arguments around school curriculum and hate speech and worse. So I wrote this piece in part to take a look back at those prejudices and who was affected and how, hoping that we can learn from those mistakes. Well, Melissa, we so appreciate you and we appreciate you sharing you know, this part of your own story and your family's story and, and putting it out there for to resonate with our readers. And thank you so much for all of the hard work that you put into the piece. It's been such a joy to work with you. And thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It has been such a pleasure. For those who haven't read the story, go and read it. It's so profound, but also really fun. And for those who have read it, you should go read it again. <laughs> and share it. And share it. Yeah. If you've read it and you enjoyed it, you know, that is also extraordinarily helpful for you to go and share the story with others who can enjoy it. And start a vaudeville troupe of your own. We actually have several here in Eugene, Oregon. That's some great advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for watching and we will see you next time. Bye everybody.